Well, welcome everybody. I'm really, really glad to see you here. And it just always excites my heart when people have hunger for the Word of God. And this book especially has been, for me anyway, a lot of fun just digging into this every every time. It, I was going to say every week, and then Peter reminded me this morning. He said, you're going to have to go over the whole book again because three weeks ago was the last class, and we don't remember. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to pick up in chapter 21. While you're flipping to that, I'll just offer a brief prayer. Oh, Lord, thank you for this glimpse through the vision that you gave to John of what our eternal destination is going to be like. And it, it's beyond our comprehension and all, all that we can conceive with our limited imaginations. But we pray as we get this glimpse of it that you excite our hearts so that we look forward to it and that we do not dread it or fear, but that we can't wait till the day is accomplished and we see all things up close. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, chapter 21. And I think we finished verse 8 when last we met a month ago. So we're going to pick up at verse 9. I have about 33 minutes, but maybe by the grace of God, we'll, we'll finish the chapter. So let's take a look at it. Should I read through the whole thing together first? Or, is that helpful? I find that helpful. Okay, let's, let's do that. Let's just read from verse 9 to the end of the chapter. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its breadth. And he measured the city with his rod, twelve thousand stadia, its length and breadth and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by a man's measure, that is, an angel's. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it, and its gates shall never be shut by day, and there shall be no night there. They shall bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean shall enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. All right, so this marvelous picture of the new Jerusalem coming down. Now remember that this is a vision, and it's a vision expressed to us in apocalyptic literature. So what it is conveying to us is spiritual truths and realities about the final and ultimate kingdom of God, um, not literal. And you're, you'll see that as we go through it. But I don't want you to read this stuff and be picturing heaven is going to look like this and it's going to have this many gates and all this. That's not the, that's not the point, right? Um, so, so let's break that down. So at verse 9, um, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven plagues spoke to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. lamb. So the lamb is very prominent here, right? Between here and chapter 22, verse 3, the lamb is going to be mentioned seven times. But what is it that he's showing? That's the wife 
of the Lamb, or the bride of the Lamb. Now, what is the bride of, well, who's the Lamb? Jesus. Right. And so what is the bride of the Lamb? This imagery, we've seen it already in Revelation, also big in Ephesians, church, other places. Church. Church. Yes, God's people. Right, God's people. So he's showing us who? Those of us who are redeemed. It's a picture of the of those who are redeemed in the final kingdom. Um, the the wife of the lamb is contrasted in the book of Revelation with what other woman? Yeah, the great prostitute of Babylon, right? So you got these two women, the prostitute, the great harlot, and the bride of Christ, who's pure and, and holy. Um, what is the, what did we say the, the great harlot is? Or what did I say it is? You might disagree with me. I don't know. But, um, what is the great harlot, the great whore of Babylon? That is most closely associated, I think, with what we would describe today as the world. All in the universe that is in rebellion against God. So those are, those are the two contrasts that we're seeing in this book. Uh, verse 10, In the Spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain, now, uh, from this high mountain, he's going to see something. So, what do you think of when you think of a high mountain in the Bible? A high mountain. What's the significance of a mountain in the Bible? There's probably more than one. There's one in particular that, to me, comes to mind right away. Sinai. Yes, Sinai, right? God is up at the top of Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up there where he sees God. The people and the animals can't touch it because God is up there and they'll defile it and they die if they touch it. Um, so to be at the top of the mountain and be able to see from there, if the mountain should evoke for us the place of God, what does seeing from the mountain um, communicate? Isn't that telling us this is like the God's eye picture? Right? This is from God's perspective what, what, what John is being allowed to look at. And what is it that he sees? The holy city Jerusalem. And what's it doing? It's coming down out of heaven. So coming down from heaven tells us that it is a gift. Right? It's being given by the Lord. And what is this city? So what do you do in a city? Basic, real basic here. What do you do in a city? You live. live there, right? So this is the, the dwelling place, the living place for all of God's people. And this place is going to be the holy city, Jerusalem. We've already looked up a bunch of passages on Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is also contrasted in the book of Revelation with another city. Just like the bride and the harlot, what's the, what's the contrasting city to the holy Jerusalem? Babylon. Yeah, Babylon, right? So what is Babylon? Babylon is this system in the world of everything that is um, self-indulgent and um, extravagant and admires wealth and riches and prosperity and greatness um, contrasted with holiness and purity and righteousness in, in Jerusalem. So these two cities, and the city where we'll live is the holy city Jerusalem. What do we see about it? Verse 11. It has the glory of God. Now what does glory look like? How would you know if you saw glory? I'm not sure. Does anyone know? I don't, I'm not sure. I think the glory of God is one of those things you can't look at something and say, take a picture of it and say, ah, this is glory. Let's put this in the dictionary. So that's part of the reason for all this imagery. The imagery conveys to us the greatness and majesty of something that we just can't see and identify visually. So what does this glory look like? It's radiance, like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Um, we saw in chapter 4 how the Lord was surrounded with Jasper there, right? So every place, we're going to see it three, I think three times in this chapter, um, where you see the word clear 
or transparent? What do we think of when we think of clear and transparent glass? But they couldn't, they, they weren't able to make glass like we make glass today. So that word for clear and transparent really, it's not meaning like see-through like what we would think of today. What that's really referring to is sparkling. Like the glass that they could make, how it would sh shimmer in the sunlight when the light hits it. So when you think maybe of your, your grandmother's best crystal set and you take it out and set it in the sunlight for the garden party or something and the light is glistening off it. Or your wife's diamond ring, right? Or something like that, right? That's, that's the picture you get here. That what is this city? It's radiant. It's sparkling. It's a way of conveying this glory of God that it has. And verse 12, it has a, a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of, of Israel. Uh, three on each side, verse 13. Okay, what's the significance of having a wall? Does the place where we're going to live in heaven need a wall? Do you, yeah, is there anything that you have to be afraid of or worry about? So, so what is the significance of having a wall around your city? Especially think first century, right? What, what, what's, what's that convey? To know that you've got a wall around your city. You're protected. That's it. Yeah, you're, you're guarded there. You're safe when you get to heaven. You're protected. You're guarded. Um, and it, it's got these 12 gates, and at each gate there's an angel. Look over, flip open to uh, Isaiah 62, verse 6. Would someone read that for us? Isaiah 62, verse 6. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night, they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest. All right, so the Lord, they're promising to put watchmen on the walls. So this idea of having angels at each of the gates, kind of like watchmen, again, what does that convey? The idea that you've got an angel at the gate watching over. You know, I, when I pray for people, a lot of times I'll pray that God would put angels at your doors and your windows. What, what am I praying for when I pray that? Protection. You know, when you open the door and go out, you're going to bump into somebody. <laughs> That's not it. What am I praying for? Protection. Yeah, that he watches over you and protects you. So these watchmen at each of the gates, what is that conveying? Again, just like the wall. Protection. Safety. Security. You're being watched over. You're being taken care of. Um, and the, how many gates are there? There are 12. And the 12 gates are named for... The twelve tribes, right? Um, flip open to Ezekiel forty-eight, the last chapter of Ezekiel. I have you do all of these in the Old Testament because I told you at the very beginning of this class, of this course, that um, this book is filled with allusions to things in the Old Testament. No quotes from the Old Testament, but but images, pictures. Uh, Ideas, concepts from the Old Testament are appearing throughout Revelation. Here, here happens to be another one. Go to e Ezekiel 48. You don't look up Ezekiel that much, do you? It's not, it's not the book we go to that commonly. 48. Ezekiel 48. Just kind of take 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 15 seconds here and just scan the chapter. Chapter 48. Just just scan it. Look over it. It's a map. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's got dimensions and it's talking about all the 12 tribe so each one's going to have a place there and then go especially to verse 30 30 to the end of the chapter these will be the eggs oh I'm, I got the wrong translation uh, I, it's not a bad translation it's just not the one you're looking at so I'll throw you all off if you if you're looking at it. 
But as you scan that, you see that there's gates on each side of this city that stand for the 12 tribes of Israel. So this image in Revelation 21, where does that image appear? It's in the Old Testament, right? And what's the significance of all of that? Look at the very end of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 48, the very last verse. And the name of the city from that time on will be... The Lord is there. The Lord is there. Yes. So this imagery of having the, the gates assigned to all of God's people, it should reinforce for people who know their Old Testament, God's readers, that, that the Lord is present in this place and all of His people are there. Um, and so there's three gates on each side, and each one is, stands for one of the tribes. Now, um, verse 14, I wonder if I want to mention that here later. Yeah, I was thinking about that one. What are the foundations? I said, yeah. what does that mean? Let, let me do verse 14, and then we'll just kind of backtrack a little bit. So verse 14 the wall of the city has 12 foundations. So you've got three gates on each wall, and then the wall is built on 12 foundations. And on each foundation, there's a name of one of the 12 apostles. So you've got the 12 tribes of Israel, and you've got the 12 apostles. What might that be? Convey what might that symbol be pointing toward? That's it, Tammy. That's Say it, it again? exactly. What, what? You, you've got the 12, she said, all encompassing. So it's the oh. 12 tribes, meaning God's Old Testament people. And it's got the 12 apostles. Um, and who, to whom does that refer? Where, where are we? New Testament. Yeah, look up, uh, look up real fast Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Is there a volunteer who would read that? Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the holy temple in the Lord. Beautiful. You are built on the foundation of the apostles. What does that mean? That, that the Lord gave his word to the apostles. The word is conveyed for us in the scriptures, and it's the scriptures that are the source of your faith. You couldn't be a Christian if you didn't have God's Word. You couldn't be a Christian if God had not given His Word to the apostles who wrote it down. So you are built on the foundation of the apostles. So the 12 tribes of Israel, that's God's Old Testament people. And the 12 foundations that on which we are built, that's God's New Testament people. So the picture here of this city is a picture of like Tammy said, all-encompassing. It's all of God's people. He's got us all together. He doesn't have a separate plan for Israel that he has for the New Testament saints. All of God's people throughout all of time will end up in this place, in, in, in this state. It's going to be marvelous, a wonderful thing. We've seen this imagery by the, before, by the way, too, in chapter 4. Once again, remember the throne had the 24 elders around the throne? What did we say was significant about 24? 12, 12 plus 12. So it's a way of describing all of, all of God's. Okay, verse 15. And then he who talked to me, so this angel has a measuring rod. And so now he's going to measure the city. You ready for this? Verse 16, the city lies four square. So it's, it's a squared off city. And the length is the same as the breadth. It's 12,000 stadia. And then the end of verse 16, it's length and breadth and height are all this equal. Right. 
each too. each one of those sides is twelve thousand stadia. So a stadia is six hundred and seven feet. So twelve thousand stadia is about fourteen hundred miles. So this is a picture of a city that's fourteen hundred miles. By 1,400 by 1, hundred miles, by 1,400 miles, a complete wow. cube. Now, do you think that that's a literal city? No, that's a, no clear, this, clearly this is symbolic, right? It's, it's, it's imagery. Um, what's, what does it convey? What's the significance of telling us this city that looks like this? Room for Plenty of room. <laughs> I like that. Well, here's a clue for you. There's only one other cube. This is a perfect cube, right? Mm -hmm. There's only one other cube in the whole Bible. One cube in the Bible besides this one. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6. Verse 20. Oops. Yeah! <laughs> That's right. Dad, Dad gets the trivia prize today. <laughs> what did he say? Oh, well, you're going to look it up in a second. <laughs> First Kings chapter 6. Would someone read, please, verse 20? The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. And he overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid an altar of cedar. All right, so what that's talking about is the Holy of Holies. So I've, I've shown you pictures of the temple before, right? To get into the temple, first you had to go through the court of the Gentiles, and then you go into the court of the women, and then you go into the central court, and then you go into the main building, and inside of that is the Holy of Holies. In other words, you're passing through all these layers, these barriers to get to the place where God is. To get to God, you don't just walk into his office and rap on the door and go, hey, hey sovereign almighty dude, can we, can we chat a little bit? He's God. To get in there, you're going past all these layers, these barriers. Um, but once you get into the Holy of Holies, why is it the Holy of Holies? Because that's where God is in the Old Testament, symbolically. Who could go in the Holy of Holies? Only one person. Who was it? The priest. Yeah, the chosen priest. And, and how often year. could he go? Just once a year. Once a year. Yeah. And you remember the story, you probably heard this in a sermon about Zechariah and John the Baptist, right? They tied a, they would tie a rope around his leg. Oh, yeah. So that if he happened to die while he was in the Holy of Holies, you would drag him out because you couldn't go in there to get him. Right. Because that's God in there, right? The Holy of Holies, that's where God is in this cube. Now we see the new Jerusalem, and what is it? It's a giant cube. What's it telling you? It's the Holy of Holies. This is where God is. Where you're going to be in heaven one day, that's where God is in the holiest of places. Um, it all pictured for us in this beautiful image of this giant city. Verse 17, he, also, he measured the wall. So he measures 144 cubits by a man's measure that is an angel. So whether it's an angel or a man measuring, it's 144 cubits. Now picture a city 1,400 miles high. What's the significance of having a wall that's only 144 cubits? If you, if you went you know, 1,500 miles in the air and look down, you wouldn't even see the wall, right? So it, this is not literal. It's, it's, it's imagery. Um, so it's letting us know about this, uh, about this wall, that it's 144 cubits. What would be significant about that? What's, a, what's 144? 12 times 12. Yeah, so you see these symbolic numbers all coming in here? Again, letting us know the, 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 the totality, the all-encompassing of God and, and his people. Um, verse 18, the walls built of jasper, while the city is pure gold, clear as glass, in other words, shimmering, 
like, like glass, radiant like glass. Um, the foundations of the wall of the city are adorned with every jewel. And then it lists uh, 12 jewels there from verses 19 to, to 20. Um, what would be the significance of these various jewels being in the foundation? Didn't the priests the wear jewels? Yeah, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to give you two answers. Uh, first, let's look up um, Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. Would someone read verse 12 for me? I will make your pinnacles of agate. How would I pronounce that? Word? Agate. Your gates of carbuncles and all your wall of precious stones. All right. So, so God promised in the Old Testament that He was going to make His people's wall out of precious stones. So here's a fulfillment of that, right? This idea that um, the, the heavenly Jerusalem has all these precious stones in the foundation. Um, it shows that the promises of God of this future kingdom are being fulfilled in this, in this city. But what else? Why, why 12? Why, why aren't there six kinds of precious stones or... 11 kinds of precious stones. What's significant about 12 kinds of precious stones? Well, it's a completion. Yeah, we've seen the significance of 12 quite a bit. But there's another thing in the Old Testament that crops in here. Um, Cheryl mentioned it. Um, do we have time? Yeah, we, let, let's look up. Ephesians 28. Not Ephesians. Exodus 28. Yeah, that's <laughs> Exodus 28. Sorry. Exodus 28. So this in Exodus 28, we're reading part of all the instructions that God gave to Moses for how he wanted the Jewish religion to be kind of set up and the, the devices and the furniture and the clothing and all the things that were part of it. This, this is part of the instruction. And if you look in chapter 28 at verse um, Two? Six, 6, you see that there was command to, to have an ephod. An ephod is like a, like a, yeah, like a sh kind of a fancy shirt, right? And then go to verse 15, and he commands that there be a breast piece that goes on this, this ephod. Go to verse 17. Then mount four rows of precious stones on it, and it mentions what the stones are. Now, I have tried without success to try to match all the stones here in Exodus to the stones in Revelation. They don't match up. Part of the problem is, too, we don't know exactly. We're guessing at some of these stones. We, it, you know, it's a Hebrew word that's 3,500 years old, so we think that's talking about emeralds, but we, <laughs> right, we don't know for sure. But the point is not that they have to match up exactly. The point here is, once again, the vision of John is drawing on this imagery from the Old Testament, that there was this breast place, breast piece, that the high priest wore, wore with 12 valuable gems attached to it. What was the importance of having those gems attached to this ephod in Exodus 28 uh, verse 29. Would someone read that? So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. So when the priest would go into the holy place, he had this breastplate on as a reminder to God of God's people. Each, each gem stood for one of the tribes. It was a reminder to God of God's people. So in the new Jerusalem, those gems are built right into the wall. So what does it do? It serves as a constant reminder to God of the preciousness of you. How precious and valuable you are to the Lord. The Lord always looks upon that. 
in his in his this new city. It's going to be so marvelous. And get to verse twenty two in Revelation back in Rev twenty two now. Uh, Rev twenty one. Sorry. Uh, verse twenty two. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. What was the significance of the temple in the Old Testament? What was important about the temple? Place where God lived. That's where God lived, right. If you wanted to meet God, if you wanted to know where God was, if you wanted to imagine God's dwelling, God's residence in this vast cosmos in which we find ourselves where was it? it was in the temple now Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus gives a new imagery for the temple what does he say the temple is his body right tear down this temple and in three days I will raise it up again so what's what's he saying by that where does God live once Jesus comes in Jesus where do you meet God when you meet Jesus and then Jesus ascends into heaven, and now there's more new imagery of the temple of God. And in uh, the book of Peter, where does Peter say the temple is? Be yourselves like precious stones built up into the temple of the Lord. In other words, the temple is the church, right? God's people. Where does God live now? Among you, between those of you who have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, here's new imagery for the, the temple in Revelation 21, where when we get to the final culminated eternal kingdom, heaven, I guess I'll just call it for simplicity's sake, where is the temple there? There is none. Why? Yeah, because God dwells every... God is the temple now. And we are in the very presence of God for forever. You know, when you when you get to heaven, I don't know what you think you're going to do. I, when I was a kid, I used to think, oh, I'm, I like my dad's train set a lot. I thought, I'm going to get like a full-size locomotive, and I'm going like, to take locomotive rides. And I had an admiral I worked for. He, I know he told me once he was pretty sure that there was golf in heaven. He wanted to play golf when he got up there. Um, I don't know what you think you're going to do when you get to heaven. But what's going to be the greatest and best thing about heaven? Be, being in that presence of God so tight that it's all around you and that you see it and you're experiencing it in its fullness. That John can't even convey it except to use all these, these images. Verse 23, Revelation 21, 23. And this, oh, was there a question? Okay, 23. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Would someone look up Isaiah chapter 60? Isaiah 60. And read verse 19. Isaiah 60, verse 19. Yes. The sun shall be no more. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. All right, so there even in the Old Testament was this prophecy that one day there would be no sun. Why? Because the glory of the Lord provides all the light that you need. Um, now, once again, is this like a literal picture? Does, is this trying to tell us what the astronomy of heaven is going to be like? When we get to heaven, we're going to look up and we won't see the moon or anything like that. That's not the point. What is the point? That the things that for us now are sources of, of light. In, in heaven, the brightness of God's very presence blots out all darkness. There's no need for special light. Because um, the glory of the Lord uh, is, is everywhere. Verse 25, And its gates will never be shut by day, and there shall be no night there. Why is there no night? It's always light. Yeah, there's no darkness. It's always light. Well, what about when you want to go to sleep? 
<laughs> you don't, yeah, there is no you don't need sleep there, right? Uh, you know, no, no point. What, what, why would the gates never be shut? In, a, in an ancient city, you had a wall around the city and you had a gate. And then the gate was open during the day and you would shut the gate at night to prevent. There would be no threat. Yeah, prevent people from coming in and out at night. So if the gates are always open, what There's is that no telling threat. us? There's no threat. There's no danger. You're safe. You're secure. Um, I like 27. Yeah, it's beautiful here. In verse 27, um, nothing unclean uh, shall enter it, nor any one of the who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, so nothing. Oh, who's there? The people who are written in the Lamb's book of life, God's people, and we're changed, right? He has made us all new. What if God took us all to heaven right now? Just kind of the way we are now. <laughs> we well, kind of mistrust each other. Yeah, pretty, you know, I love all of you, but pretty soon I'd be arguing with you and we'd be fighting over stuff, right? Um, he changes us. That's what glorification is all about. We're going to be different when we get there. I'll, I'll just say one, I'm, I'm a minute and a half past. Can I just do one closing thing? Is that all right? Um, verse 27, they shall bring into it the glory and the honor of the of the nations. Um, verse 24, by its light shall the nations walk and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. So if we took that too literally, what you have is this great city, but what's outside the city? The Goyim, the nations. And so the nations are coming into the city to bring their honor and their praise, but they're still outside of the city. Um, that's not so once again, that's not the, the point. This is not a spatial dimension that it's trying to convey to us about what heaven is like. The, the imagery of the nations bringing their wealth and their honor to the Lamb, to the Lord, where does that come from? It comes from the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament tells in many places. I was going to have us look it up, but you could look up, for example, Isaiah chapter 2. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nation shall not war against nation anymore, but they, they would bring all of their treasures to the Lord. Uh, that's not talking about the millennial kingdom. That's the way the, that's the, way the dispensationalists read it. That's talking about the eternal kingdom of God. It's a way of saying everything that is out there will all glorify point one day toward the majesty and the greatness of God. And so John's vision here is saying those promises in the Old Testament are fulfilled in this final culmination of heaven, the way, the way it turns out. Everything points to God. Okay, so who's ready to go? I got a sign-up sheet upstairs. So can, we, can we sign up for a trip to heaven? Good. I hope you're all signed up. <laughs> In your baptism you were called, and in faith, that is what you trust in. Uh, and it's going to be great. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks for letting me go late. Uh, we might finish next week. One more chapter in Revelation. We might be, we might be done.